Good evening, everyone. You know, we don't have a, a microphone. So I'm going to speak from my diaphragm, they say. Um, to God be the glory. Amen. Great things he has done. It's such a privilege to be here today and for this week. Um, I do want to thank Elder Noel and Brother Zam and all those who made this event possible. It's my first time in England. And um, it is a place I would hope to visit before I die. So I thank God that I'm here while I'm living. Amen? Amen. And we have a lot to share this week. I know you guys will be tremendously blessed. Um, as the Elder said that the, the Soul Winner book will begin promptly at the appointed time. You need something to write with. It is a workbook, and we, we're going to entertain dialogue questions as we go along. So please be on time and make sure you have a utensil to write with. Now, for this night's uh, nightly service, we have a series of lectures on spiritualism. It is actually a seven-part series. Uh, it is not for the faint of heart. We're going to go deep, deep, deep sea diving this week. So we hope that you bring your Bibles, uh, you have something to write with. We have a lot to cover, and uh, the texts are on the screen. Now, we are going to look at part one tonight, which is entitled, uh, The Next Stop, Hell. Uh, Adolf Hitler was actually a, a certified madman by most historians. He was a man that... Uh, hated Jews and gypsies and black, and it was his intent to have one pure Aryan race. And he had blamed the Jews for the, the financial uh, pitfall that had befallen Germany. And he devised a plan to exterminate them. Uh, and the man that uh, would, would be the, 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 uh, the catalyst was a fellow by the name of a uh, Heinrich Himmler. And this is Himmler's words. He said this. Heinrich Himmler instructed, quoting, the Fuhrer has ordered the what? Final. The final solution of the Jewish question. We, the SS, have to carry this order. I have therefore chosen outreach for this purpose. And there were others, Treblanka and Seidborg and so forth, but Auschwitz was the, was the catalyst for the, the final solution of the Jewish people. Now they had a problem. How would they get the Jews from point A, Warsaw and so forth, to Auschwitz uh, without creating chaos? And somebody said, why not use trains? And most of them were a little bit deceived as to where they were going. Propaganda had spread. And many willingly went on these train, thinking they were going to someplace better. My dear friends, they were put in trains like, like how we would you know, put cattle uh, to be slaughtered. And when some caught wind of it, they fought. But my dear friends, by the time they got to Outreach, it was too late. Trains were used to bring them to their final demise. Are you with me? Now, I'm heading somewhere tonight, so just stick with me. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me to 1 Samuel. We're quoting from the King James Version, the authorized version. 1 Samuel. We have Ruth and we have Samuel. 1 Samuel, chapter 9, verse number 9. Are we there? 1 Samuel 9 and verse 9, and the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9. 1 Samuel 9 and verse 9. Are we there? Amen? Amen. And the Bible says this. Before time, in where? Israel. In Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, Thus he spake, come let us go to the who? Yeah. You want to underscore seer or circle seer in your Bible. He says, he that is now called a prophet was before time called a what? Seer. Yeah. Seer. Now, prophets were the eyes of the church. They saw for those who could not see. They were the eyes 
of Israel. If you go to Proverbs 29, that's Proverbs 29, uh, verse 18. One more text that shed lights on this evening's message. Proverbs 29, look at verse number 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18, we know this text. Uh, Proverbs 29 and verse 18, a text that we can probably quote by, uh, uh, from memory, right? It says this, where there is no what? Vision. Vision, the people what? But he that keepeth the law, happy is what? So here we've learned thus far that prophets were called what? They were the eyes of the church. And the Bible says where there's no vision, the people what? Perish. Now, beloved, we realize that God blessed this church by a prophet. Amen? A true prophet. And it is said that she and, she and Moses actually reigned the longest. If you do the math, they reigned the longest in prophetic uh, history time span. Throughout her tenor, she received approximately... 2,000 prophetic visions and dreams. She reigned for 70 years, began in 1844 to 19, 1915, my dear friends. And these visions are here to guide us because after all, if she was a prophet, she was a, a seer. The record said her visions uh, in, in length varied from 15 minutes to nearly four hours. Now bear in mind, when a prophet is in vision, they can't breathe. Am I talking truth? They can't breathe and their eyes are open and, and they're usually weak. And when the angel touches them, they get superhuman strength. Can you imagine not breathing for four hours, let alone 15 minutes? And I read somewhere that the 15 minute vision she wrote for one week, what she saw. For one week. Revelation 12, verse 9. The Bible says this on the screen. And that of Satan and that great dragon was cast out, right? That old what? Yes. Serpent called the who? Yes. Devil and what? Yes. So here in the Bible, Satan has a multiplicity of titles, but one of them John gave him, he gave him the title of a serpent. Now, my dear friends, there's not much to watch on television. Uh, and I find myself watching more uh, Animal Planet than anything else. In one week, they had a whole series on snakes. And I actually adjusted my schedule so I could watch it. And they featured a snake. I would never forget it. They dubbed this snake. He was called the, the King Cobra. And my dear friends, it is said that his length is about the size of an automobile. The length. That's how tall he is. And when he gets up on his tail, he is as tall as an iron. And the record says that when he lets his poisonous venom fly, he doesn't aim at the chest. He doesn't aim at the, the limbs. He doesn't aim at the feet. The record says he aims at the eyes. Thus he blinds his opponent and they can't see. John says the devil is a serpent and I believe that he is a spitting Cobra. His poisonous venom fly, my dear friends. That's how he operates. And I believe it is Satan's plan uh, to attack the eyes of the church. Because after all, without no vision, the people perish. And thus, Satan's last attack will be against the eyes of the remnant church. Because the Bible says the prophets were called seers. And without no vision, we're going to perish. In first selected messages, book uh, page 48, paragraph 3, she says this. The very last reception of Satan will be to make none effect to what? The testimony of what? Spirit of God's spirit. And she says, and she quotes Proverbs, where there is no what? The people what? What's that word? Perish. She says Satan will work ingeniously in different ways through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true what? <coughs> He's attacking the eyes of the church. Then she goes on to say in that same book, page 48, there will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies that is what? Satanic. So when you see people who are launching this venomous attack against the spirit of prophecy, you know they are under a satanic delusion. 
She goes on to say, the working of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the church in them. Here it is now. This is the punchline. For this reason, Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his what? So you have to take out the eyes. Then now you have a platform to bring in the deception. Are you with me? She says, and bind up souls in his illusion if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. Now, beloved, I believe that the monument of the Spirit of Prophecy is this book right here. It's called The Great Controversy. And if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, you haven't read this book, I really pity you. I really, really, really pity you. Now, there are some chapters I encourage people, you need to wrap your mind around. Chapters uh, 29, The Origin of Evil. Chapters 30, the enmity between man and Satan. Chapters 31, the agency of evil spirits. Chapters 32, the sneer of Satan. Chapter 33, the first great deception. And 34, can the dead speak to us? And there is a common denominator that runs through these uh, five or six chapters. And that denominator is spiritualism. Are you with me? Now, throughout the 2,000 visions that she had, uh, I want us to focus on one this afternoon, and this will be my thesis for the entire week. It is actually chronicled in the book Early Writings, one of the very first books was written on page 88. And I'm going to read to you, and we're going to take flight this afternoon. Quoting, she says, I saw the, what, the rapidity with which this, a specific delusion, was spreading. She says a what? And that's my title, Soul Train. A train of cars was showing, showing me going the speed of what? Lightning. I begged my angel, the angel begged me, look carefully. I fixed my, my eyes upon the train. It seemed that the whole world was on board. And last time I checked, there are approximately 7 billion people. Well, at that time frame when she wrote it, we didn't have 7 billion. But I believe today that 7 billion people are on this train except a small group of people known as the elect. She goes on to say now, right? Right? Uh, it seemed the whole was on board, right? Then the angel, and, and that there could be none left, said the angel, they are binding in bundles to be what? So my dear friends, we know where this train is headed. It's heading to hell. This train will not pull into the Grand Central Station. This train is taking these people to perdition. She goes on to say, Then he showed me the conductor, who all the passengers, who appeared stately, a fair person, whom all the passengers looked up to and reverenced. I was perplexed, and I asked my attendant angel who it was. He said, It is who? Satan. It is Satan. He's the conductor in the form of an angel of what? Of light. He has taken the world captive, given them to strong delusion to believe a lie that they all might be damned. Are you with me? Yeah. Then she says they are all going with lightning speed to perdition. I asked the angel if there were none left. He bade me look in the opposite direction. And I saw a little company traveling the narrow path. All emphasis seemed to be Firmly united, bounded together by not traditions or feelings or whatever, by truth in bundles or companies. Said the angel, the third angel is binding or sealing them in bundles for the heavenly garment. So one class is getting ready to be burnt. One class is getting sealed for the heavenly garment. Amen. Now, beloved, I want you to really understand the gravity of this statement because we, we are told, conservatively, there are, we have approximately, and this is probably outdated, but just work this chart, there is approximately 974 million Roman Catholics, and all of them are on that train. The Eastern Orthodox number 164 million, and every one of them is on that train. My dear friends, the, not to mention Buddhism and the various sects, 
one billion, one hundred million, and they're all on that train. My dear friends, Hindus number 690 million, and they're all on that train. My dear friends, the Japanese religion number 230 million, and every one of them are on that train. And then we have the tribal religious people, 100 million approximately. These are indigenous people, and every one of them is on that train. And then we have the Mohammedans, 924 million. And then, my dear, we have Protestants, which are approximately uh, 351 million, except a small little group, she says, are not on that train. And you know the sad thing, God raised us up as a people not to be on the train. But alas, as you shall see throughout these meetings, many have gotten on with whole families, whole churches are on board, getting ready to be burnt, my dear friends. And so it is the objective this week to cause you, if you're on that train, you need to get off. Let me put a plug in. This train is not stopping. So you're going to have to find a way to bail off a moving train. Are you with me? Now look at this thing now, my dear friend. So the train she saw. Now I believe that this train is a metaphor for something. I believe, and I'm going to show you, it is a metaphor for spiritualism. Now I want you to follow me up. Now John, who is a prophet also, he was a seer. He's on the Isles of Patmos. Stick a pin. John saw the same thing that Ellen White saw, but from a different perspective. Are you with me? The Bible says now, in Revelation 16, Revelation 16, the Bible says this now. John says, I saw how many? Three unclean spirits like what? Now you want to underscore frogs. This is the only, this is the, the first, only the first time frogs is mentioned in the New Testament. It doesn't appear, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John don't mention it. Only one time it is mentioned in the New Testament is in this context, right? John said, I saw three unclean spirit like frogs come out of the mouth of who? The dragon underscore the dragon. Out of the mouth of the who? The beast. And out of the mouth of the what? False prophets. Now here it is. Now John said he saw, three, he saw three entities. He saw the dragon. He saw the beast. And he saw the false prophet. And John said, I saw three unclean spirit. Now bear in mind, this three unclean spirit is Satan trying to counterfeit the triune Godhead. This is what we call Satan's trinity. Now the Bible says that we have a triune Godhead. Are you with me? The Bible says in 1 John 5, 7, jot this text down, for there are what? Three that be a record where? In heaven. The Bible says the Father, the Word, and who? And they are what? They are one. One in purpose, one in aim, one in mode of operation. One, there is no duplicity with the Godhead. God don't say yes, uh, the Son say no, and the Holy Ghost say maybe. No is no across the board, my dear friends. Are you with me? Now, there's one thing that binds God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost together, and that word is truth. Amen. The same thing that binds the companies, and the wife says, they are bounded together by what? Truth. My dear friends, you jot these texts on. God the Father is truth. Romans 3, verse 4. Are you with me? The Son is truth. He's, he's called truth. In John 14, verse 6. And the Holy Ghost is called the Spirit of truth, my dear friends. There is no lie with the Godhead. So the thing that binds the Godhead together, what's that word? Truth. And that's the same truth that binds the company that Ellen White saw that was not on the train. Now I want you to turn the card over now. So here we see now the Godhead is bounded together by truth. Now let's go back to the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Satan's counterfeit now. Are you with me? I want you to follow me now. Now, this is Satan's uh, counterfeit trinity. Now, we don't use the word trinity in our church. Well, we didn't. Because it's a, it's a Catholic concept. We, we use the word is the Godhead we use. Right, or the triune God, or that's the Godhead, but we don't, we don't use Trinity, but it's a different thing today now. Now, what's this thing now? This counterfeit Trinity is based on one concept of the Trinity itself. The dragon, the beast, and the prophets 
are three manifestations of one being what? Satan. Follow me now, my dear friends, right? The true Godhead is composed of three distinct eternal beings. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Are you with me? The dragon is said to be Satan, right? Revelation 12, 9. He is, it was he that moved upon Herod to destroy our Savior. Follow me now. But the chief agent of Satan in making war against, upon Christ and his people in the first century of the Christian era was through Ro the Roman what? Empire. Empire, with me. So nations that Satan used can sometimes be called a dragon. Go to Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel 34, I think. I'm going to show you Ezekiel chapter 30, Ezekiel 29. I'm going to show you that nations, Ezekiel 29, nations that are employed by Satan can take the title of a dragon. Are you with me? Yes. I want you to follow me tonight now because I'm heading somewhere. We've got plenty of time. We're out in the bush. We ain't, we ain't got no malls. <laughs> Some of us, we, you know, so we ain't got nowhere to go. We just going to tarry in Jerusalem tonight. We're going to study. Look at... Uh, um, Ezekiel 29, are we, uh, 29, are, are we there? Look at verse 2, right? And the Bible says, are we there? Yes. So nations that Satan worked through can sometimes be called a dragon. The Bible says down in verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against who? Pharaoh. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all what? Egypt. Speak and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that great what? Dragon. So Satan worked through Pharaoh to persecute God's people, and he was called a dragon. So nations that Satan worked through can be called a dragon. Now, he's the original dragon, but he works through powers to persecute. So in this context, the three unclean spirits, the dragon represents Satan in its primary sense, but its secondary sense, it represents Pagan Rome. Rome had two phases, pagan and papal. Are you with me? Now, watch this thing now. The beast in that same chapter, Revelation 16, right, is described as a leopard. This beast represents the papacy, the Catholic Church. Are you with me? So the dragon is paganism. The beast is the Roman Catholic Church. Follow me now. And then now, the Bible says there was a false prophet. The false prophet represents apostate Protestantism. Whether they are Baptist, Church of God in Christ, holiness, you call them whatever. Now let me just say this. God has good people in churches. We're not here knocking people. We're we 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 challenging system of beliefs. God has sincere Catholics, sincere Baptists, sincere Church of God in Christ, and he's going to bring them out of that system into his true system. Are you with me? Now I want to say tonight, we are not here judging people. We are judging ideas. God hasn't given me the right to judge people. But I am commanded to judge an idea. The Bible says, prove all things. And if I condemn an idea, it doesn't mean I am condemning a person. Are you with me? Now, so here we see on the dragon. So the dragon is paganism, all pagan religion. Watch it now. The beast is the Catholic Church system, Pope Francis. And the false prophets represents the apostate Protestant preachers out there. Now, what was the element that binds the Godhead together? Truth, right? Now, what do you think binds Satan's trinity together? Lies! Lies! And there's one common lie. That the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet have together. And I'm going to show you. Because this man here does not believe that Mary is his intercessor. So he will never be a Catholic as T.D. Jakes. And the devil, that's, that's fine. I don't want you to be a Catholic. But if, you, if there's one thing that binds all you together, I got you. And the thing that binds pagans, Catholics... And him together is the belief of spiritualism. 
That is the common denominator that binds every religion together. And I'm going to show you my dear friends, biblically and historically. Now, note now, look how Satan works now. The dragon, right, seems to be the counterfeit of God the Father. Watch it now. He is clearly the leader of the group, calling up others and giving them their what? Order. So the dragon is the counterfeit for God the Father. Watch it now, right? The sea leopard beast is clearly a counterfeit of who? Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead. How do I know? The Christian reader of Revelation would recall, Jesus says, anyone who sees me sees the who? So when you see the leopard beast, who do you see? The dragon, which is Satan. Are you with me? Right? The sea beast of Revelation 13 has the same kind of relationship with the dragon that Jesus has with the Father. Now, where's the Holy Ghost? Watch it now. Right? The false prophet represents the Holy Spirit. How do I know? The land beast promotes the interest of the sea beast. So America promotes the interest of the Catholic Church. And the Holy Ghost promotes the interest of Jesus. Because it is his job to lead you to who? You can't come to Christ with the Holy Ghost. He draws you to Jesus, my dear friends. So you see how the parallel lines up. Watch this thing now. Right? And so uh, just as the Holy Ghost doesn't speak of himself, but instead of Jesus, the role of the Holy Spirit is to promote Christ. The role of America would be to promote the, the, the leopard beast of the Catholic Church, which leads them right back to Satan. As I said earlier, the thing that binds them together is lies. Now, John said he saw one thing come out of the mouth of the three unclean spirit like frogs. So frogs came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, beloved, right? He says, for they are the spirit of devils working what? Miracles. Miracles. Now, beloved, frogs. You know, I was, I was just amazed that, that, that why would John, out of all the, it's not even a creature, or the insect you could use, or whatever, or amphibians, whatever, why would he single out a frog? And I said, there must be something about a frog that shed light on spiritualism. Now, Ellen White saw the train, and the train was moving pretty fast. Watch this thing now. Frogs. New Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. We learned that. 266 chapters. 770, 7,029 verses, right, in the New Testament, right? And it breaks down to 184,590 words in the New Testament. And frogs only appear one time. Now, when I'm in school, see, in Jamaica, we, we were of the British system. We never had multiple choice. When professor, when it was exam time, he would say, I'm only going to say this once. It means you need to listen. <laughs> He's not going to repeat himself. Right? So when you see frog only one time linked to the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, John is saying, you need to take heed. Now, beloved, when we think of frogs, this should bring our minds back to where? The Exodus. That's that, connect the dots now, right? Right? The Bible says in Exodus 8, 6, 6 through 15, right? Text down. And Aaron stretched out his, his hand over the waters of Egypt, and frogs came and covered the what? The entire land of Egypt. That's imperative, right? And the Bible says now, and the magicians did so, and their enchantments, and brought frogs upon the land. Now, frogs, Ellen White says in Patriot and Prophet, frogs, the second plague brought frogs. Why? Ten plagues were ten deities. The Israelites were, uh, Egyptians were, were, were uh, monotheistic, uh, or poly rather, polytheistic. They had many gods. So the ten plagues were ten gods. They worshipped. Israel was monotheistic. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. So the second plague was, uh, uh, was an attack against the second god they worship. Here it is. 
She says the second plague brought frogs over, the, oh, over Egypt. Frogs were held sacred by the Egyptian and one of their what? Deities, Hecu, was a frog head goddess that to have creative power. And if you go and look at the Egyptians' artifacts, you'll always see some frog head. Because they really worship the frog. You see it again, the frog, right here. You see it? So it, is a, it was a bona fide thing. They worship the frog. Now, I said, Lord, there has to be more to it than just that. And beloved, I got to dig in. And I'm going to show you what the Lord showed me. And I'm going to tie what Ellen White saw and what John saw together. Look at this thing now. This is from Encarta, a secular, a secular uh, scientific uh, uh, encyclopedia. It says this. Scientists have identified over how many? 4,000 species of frogs. The punchline now. Many frogs have what? What else? What else? Or what? In their what? The helps them do what? Blend with your what? That's it. You could be outside doing, oh, a frog. They can go camouflage, which is a French word. Now let's put the math together now. Ellen White saw a train of cars going fast. John said he saw a frog. What happens now if, you, if, if, if something is moving so fast, but it can blend and change as it go, it is hard to track it, my dear friends. Now, this is the punchline now. So spiritualism is moving so fast, but it has the ability to just change on it, change on it, change on it. So it's hard to track it. Look what she says now. She says this, break on the verse, the line of distinction, are you with me? between the professed and the ungodly is hardly distinguishable. Church members love what the church loves. She says, Satan determines to unite them into one body, thus sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism, my dear friends. So when we think of spiritualism now, right? The, the, so this thesis this week, we're going to define what is spiritualism, what are some of the various aspects of spiritualism? And what role does spiritualism play in the end of time? That's the thesis we're going to cover this week. Are you with me? All right? Now, what is spiritualism? By definition, Webster said this. It is a belief that departed spirits hold intercourse or dialogue with mortals by the means of physical phenomena, rapping, during abnormal mental states, trances, or like common manifested through medium spiritism. That is the, the definition of spiritualism. Now, guess what? When we think of spiritualism, we think of Casper the Friendly Ghost. Now, let me say this. If this was all that spiritualism entailed, we would be safe, my dear friends. If this was it, we would have to have these meetings. But I'm here to tell you, it's, it's more than scooby dooby doo If it was just scooby dooby doo it would be all right. And Casper the Friendly Ghost, which he ain't no Friendly Ghost anyway, here we go. But spiritualism is changing. It is broad. Look at this thing now. She says, and I'm going to give you the reference, the very name of witchcraft is now held in what? Contempt. The claim that man can hold intercourse or dialogue with evil spirits is regarded as a favor of the dark ages. She says now, but transition. But what? Spiritualism, which numbers its converts by the what? Hundreds of thousands, yea, by the millions, I would say yea, by the billions, which has made its way into the what? Churches. It has made its way into the scientific circle. So somehow, spiritualism crept into the scientific circle. It has made its way in the churches. It has even made its way in Parliament, in Congress, in the White House. Then she says, it has even got into Buckingham Palace. 
or Windsor Palace, because we don't have kings where, where I'm from. So it has, was able to find its way into all these channels. It is like a web, spiritualism, spider web. One strand is music, right? It's in the music, my dear friends. Now we're going to talk about Bob Marley. Bob Marley was inspired by Satan. As a matter of fact, Satan, I'm going to show you, handpicked Bob Marley. You know, there's a, I read an article the other day. The, the article said the top richest dead person for 2014. So how can you be dead and still rich, making money? <laughs> Michael Jackson is number one. Bob Marley, number two. Elvis Presley, number three. Merlin Monroe, number four. Right? Look what Ed Carter said. Now, N. Carter, they, 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 they don't have no Bible. They said this. Influenced by, influenced by Rastafari movement, Marley's music contained elements of what? And what else? Wow. So Bob was on that train. I believe Bob died on that train, my dear friend. And I'm going to show you. Oh, yes. We're not guessing this week. I came too far to guess. It has even made its way in the amusements. We're going to show you amusements like yoga. And if you're doing yoga, you need to get up. Because yoga is going to lead you to hell. Yoga is baptized spiritually. And I'm going to show you. Oh yes, I'm going to show you. Historically, biblically, and hermeneutically, and linguistically. I'm going to show you. Even most of the movies, Chronicle of Narnia, steeped in spiritualism. Right? Amusements. And even the soap operas. I'm going to show you that these things are laced with spiritualism. Even some amusements. You know, this is just a giveaway. You would think Adventists would say, you know, Magic Kingdom, let's stay far from that. But you find more Adventists visiting Disney World than anything else. The very fact it's called a magic kingdom that I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters. Because the Bible condemns magic. Let me give you some more. It even shows up in these games. Dominoes, chess and checkers, card playing, which is tied to astrology. I'm going to show you. Then we have Numerology. You ever wonder why, you know, you, you have the, the, the ace, the king, the queen, the jack, and the, the, four, the four suits they call them. The queen is Mary. Yeah. And the joker, they say, is Jesus. Yeah. Look at it. Numerology. There are four suits, which are four seasons. There are 52 cards in the deck for the weeks of the year, and there are 13 cards in each suit which lines up the lunar months. Card playing is steeped in astrology. That is why now, that is why, and I never understood this statement in Ellen White when she made it, but now I see clearly now. I see clearly now. She said this now. I've been his home 498. Now remember, the prophets were called seers. So they could see into something and see the danger. And you can't see it. And God will tell them to warn his people, but we won't listen. Look what she says. There are amusements such as what? Dancing. Dancing. What else? Card playing. Chess. And what else? Which we, the Christian, can't approve. Because who? That's God the Father. That's God the Son. That's God the Holy Ghost. Cherubims, seraphims, heaven, all heaven Amen. condemns them. So we can't justify something heaven has condemned. She says these amusements, they open the door to great evil. And there's a reason why heaven condemns them, because these things are tied to astrology. And I'm going to show you. Tomorrow's lecture is called The Rise of Evil. I'm going to show you tomorrow right so it's in the amusements 
And then the reason why, you ever wonder why everything is just black and white on most of these things? It's for the same reason this is black and white. The yin and the yang. We're going to talk about yin and the yang. And it really means the balance of good and evil. My dear friends, there is no balance between good and evil. You cut the lights off, darkness comes. Amen. Cut the lights on, darkness disappears. We are told God and God and Satan does nothing in partnership. They don't say let's work together for the betterment of society. They do nothing in partnership, my dear friends. Never have, never will. And it's the same reason every time the, 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 the first lady visits the Pope, she's always in white, black. He's always in white. There's a reason behind that. And it comes from the yin and the yang. It's the same reason the dots on the dice on the dominoes are black and white. Oh, yes, I'm going to show you. Clearly. Martial arts. If you have your kids in Kung Fu, pull them out. Pull them out. That is steep in astrology. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you, my dear friends. So it's in the music. It's in the amusement. Then it is even in the science and healing. Yes. Have you ever seen this? Now, we see this on ambulance. Now, let's not get confused. Because this is not this. Don't, don't get them confused now. Moses had to lift up the serpent in the wilderness. People said the same thing. It's not the same thing. This actually is the, is the caduceus. It came from es, uh, uh, Escalipe, and he's the pagan god of medicine. You see his staff? And you see the serpent wrapped around a staff. Now, yeah, there's always people who take things to extremes. Some will say, well, now, after I've seen this, I'm not going to no more ambulance. No, 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 no. <laughs> if you are sick, you need to get in the ambulance, my dear friends. I don't care if they got 10 caduceus on it, you know what I'm And if you leave here telling that pastor, and I told you, you don't go to the ambulance, I will deny the court of law because I didn't say it. I'm just trying to heighten your awareness. I'm not here knocking medical doctors. We're not here knocking nurses. We need them. Are you with me? And but we are told if you're sick, you need to seek out a Christian doctor. Somebody who will pray with you, not pray on your insurance. You're not hearing me. Right? But we are showing you that it has even entered the science and healing. Right? So don't get this with that. It's not the same thing. Acupuncture. We're going to talk about acupuncture. And we're going to show why it's dangerous. It is spiritualism. Its origin its roots. We're going to show you, right? Time Magazine uh, had a special uh, uh, issue. Your mind can heal your body. That's a yoga pose. Acupuncture, we're going to talk about also uh, healing like a radiology. Hypnotism, magnets, Tai Chi, Qigong, applied kinesiology, vibration medicine, uh, transition meditation, reflexology, uh, home, homeopathy, Martial arts, aromatherapy, biofeedback, secular psychology, and the 12th step, which we need to help. All these are, are baptized in spiritualism. I'm talking about uh, certain essential oils. Oh, yes. I'm going to show you, my dear friends. And crystal therapy. We have a lecture called The Eastern Man. You see this man right here? You don't want to let him in your house. This man is now knocking on the church door. Do not let him in. <laughs> That's the Eastern man. And we're going to show you where all this stuff come from, my dear friends. It has entered even the healing. The healing. Right? And then it has entered even the churches. We're going to show you all these men right here. These men are steeped in witchcraft. Joel Austin with his million dollar smile. Benny Hinn has a demon. Benny Hinn, he says he talks to Catherine Kuhlman, and Catherine Kuhlman is dead. All these men are on the train. I'm not here knocking them, but their concepts, my dear friends, they have to get off the train, right? And what do I mean has entered the church? The emerging church. What is the emerging church? Let me give you some text of the emerging church. Pastors don't wear suits anymore. They wear jeans, pants, some tight jeans and a jacket 
And that's it. There's no more going to the pulpit and you kneel. Put the pulpit away, get a little stool, and we're just going to have a talk. That's what we call the emerging church, my dear friends. And then we have the neo-Pentecostalism, which we're going to talk about. So we have a lot to cover. But sad to say, this had entered our church in the concept of the new theology, which is a old theology. Now, when we talk about new theology, what is new theology? It is a concept. The base of new theology is that live as you please. Right? It is a concept. And I, I, which, which keeps leading our church close to universalism, to the concept that all churches are equally right and good and all have truth, and we will go to heaven together like that. No. That's what it says, sister. Two times it says, one for Rome and one for her daughter. That is the, the concept of new theology, my dear friends. Right? And we're going to talk about it. You've heard about the Alpha and the Omega. Two letters in the Greek alphabet, A and Z, right? Now, let me show you something. When you think about the Alpha, this is the man. He's Kellogg's, Corn Flakes man. And I read somewhere that Post, you know Post cereal? Do you have Post over here, P-O-S-T? It's a, it's a, it's a Corn Flakes brand also. Post was his, his friend. Post stole some of his secrets from Kellogg's and created his own brand. Then he committed suicide. Right? Now, Kellogg's was the one that brought in the Alpha. Right? Now, it came through this book right here, The Living Temple. Let me give you a background. The, 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 the tabernacle had burnt down. Right? By a fire. And Kellogg wrote this book. I actually tried to get a copy of it. I told my buddy, if, if you come across one, let me know. He said, not that I found one. How much it cost? Two thousand dollars. You keep it. <laughs> Two, okay, it's, it's a rare book, a rare error. It's error in it. But just for educational purposes, I, I couldn't buy it. If they had that kind of money, I wouldn't spend it anyway. Look what she says now. She says the book, the living temple, it, there is presented the what? Alpha, which is the beginning. Right? Then she says the omega will follow. It will be received by those who are not willing to heed the warning that God has given. So there is a similarity between the Alpha and the Omega. Now look what happened now. So the Battle Creek Sanitarium burnt down. Right? They, 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 they burnt down. So Kellogg said, listen, I have this book right here. We're going to print the book, use the proceeds to rebuild back the tabernacle. That's a good business plan. But what happened now this book, Living Temple, it had elements of pantheism. Pan, Pandemonium, Pandora Box, Peter Pan, Pan, House of All Gods. It was witchcraft. And so they went ahead and they printed the books. All of a sudden, the, the, the publishing house burnt down. When the fire chief came, he had a big hose. He says, quoting, there is something strange about these Adventist fires. The more water you put, is the more they burn. <laughs> you know why? Because she said an angel had a sword at me. Bah, bah. Because this book had elements of spiritualism. So the Omega will also have elements of... Right? Now look at this thing now. She says now, Be not deceived, men will depart from the faith, giving to citizens for doctrines. We have before us the Alpha of this danger, the omega will be more what? Starkling. Of the same substance. Spiritualism. Now what happens on the, on the omega? She lists about nine points. She says, in, in this book, she says, under the omega, our religion will be changed. That is the emerging church, my dear friends. Our religion has been changed. She says, books of a new order will be written. And we have seen them. I was in an ABC store in the States, uh, you know, and I was trying to get a book, Stephen Haskell's book. So I went into the ABC store. I said to the lady, um, do you have any Haskell books? She said, who? And, you know, they had a big thing at TDJ. I should have just kicked that thing down. They didn't know they have no Haskell book, but I have a big picture of TDJ from the right loose. And didn't have Stephen Haskell book in the store. Shame. Right? She says the leader, here it is now, would teach that virtue is better than vice. 
But God being removed, they would place your dependence on human what? That is spiritualism. Because the devil said to Eve, your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods. Right? Number four, the fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years will be accounted as what? Error. Error. She goes on to say, a new order will be established. She goes on to say, a system of intellectual philosophy will be introduced. All we're hearing is pure philosophy on Sabbath. Confusing people. We're, we're starving the sheep and feeding the goats in our churches. Seven, she says the founders of the system would go and do a great work, but the Sabbath, of course, would be lightly what? And my dear friends, today there is a Sabbath keeping amongst us that is foreign to Moses, foreign to Ellen White, foreign to James White, foreign to Nehemiah, that is foreign to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, Peter, James, and John. Never heard of that Sabbath keeping. I was at a large church, you know, in Florida. Spoke at the church, and I'm getting ready to leave. The head elder said to me, Pastor Nott, let's go to lunch. So I'm thinking, go to lunch, let's go to his house. He says, honey, where's my wallet? You got the credit card, we're going to Piccadilly. I said, pick a who? <laughs> I said, I'm fasting today, Pastor. I think I just fast. Because I know better. Yes. And therefore, I got to do better. Yes. But it's a common thing now amongst us, you know. To go to restaurants on Sabbath, and as a matter of fact, the last general conference they had in Atlanta, and there's a restaurant called the Hebrew Israelites. They, they cook good vegan vegan dinner, so I, I eat there sometimes. So I'm down there, or one after GC. I went there, and she said, the "Lady, said to me, are you one of us?" I said, "No, I'm a Seventh Day Adventist." She said, oh, "Last Sabbath, last Saturday, this place was packed." The line went out the door all around the corner. They had made no preparation for the Sabbath. And they read in the restaurants. Shame, my dear friends. They call it progress. Do not call it progress, my dear friends. She says the Sabbath will be lightly regarded. But you know, God will never leave himself without a witness. When I, while I was in, the, in Slough, I, I went to visit uh, 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 people who I was staying with. I went to visit their, their family in a nursing home. The man was 83 years old. It was Friday. And as I was leaving, he said to me, oh, what time is it? I got to iron my clothes because the sun's going to set. I said, look at that, ain't it? 83 years old. And this man knew he's going to iron his clothes before the sun set. God will never leave himself without a witness, my dear. Never. Right? She says nothing will be allowed to stand with his new movement. So here we see, my dear friends, spiritualism is all through the ranks of Adventism. It is all through the ranks. She says now, now, uh, she had got a copy of the book Living Temple. And her son said, Mom, have you read it? She says, I don't want to read it. She said, you need to read it. No one's supposed about it. She says, now, I did not read the Living Temple, though I had it in my wear. At last, my son said to me, Mother, you are to read at least some parts of the book that you may see whether they are in harmony with the light which God has given you. He sat down. He sat down beside me. And we read the paragraphs to which we refer. We, when we, when we had finished, I turned to him and said, quoting, these are the very sentiments against which I was bidden to speak in warning at the very beginning of my work. She goes on to say now, when I first left the state of Maine, it, it was to go through Vermont, Massachusetts, to bear a testimony against the sentiments the living temple contains the alpha of these theories. Spiritualism, pantheism. She says the omega would follow in a little while. I tremble for our people. These beautiful representations are similar to the temptation that the enemy brought to Adam and what? Now she traces the omega and the alpha right back to the garden of what? Now let's go to Eden now, beloved. There are two things Satan told Adam and Eve. Eve. Genesis says this. Now the serpent 
was more subtle than any beast that the future God had made, right? And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of every fruit of the tree in the garden. Verse 3 says, But of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not what? Neither shall you what? That's a lie. God did not say, don't touch it. You read Genesis. Eve added to the word. Right? Lest he die. The first lie he told her now. Then the serpent said, ye shall not surely die. That's the foundation of spiritualism, a belief that when you're dead, you're not really dead. Then the second component is this now, is this now, right? For God hath known, there you eat thereof, your eyes shall be what? Open. And he shall be as what? Open. Knowing what? Good and what? Evil. So it teaches that when you're dead, you're not dead, and you will enter a higher sphere of knowledge. Are you with me? So therefore, as we wind down now, I want to just, uh, just take a look, a brief study, lay a foundation. The foundation for spiritualism is this. It is a misunderstanding about death. So for these few moments, we're going to do a brief Bible study. Just to lay the foundation so when we take flight tomorrow, we're all on the same page. What really happens to a person when he or she dies? First and foremost, what happens when you die? Let's go to Psalms. Psalms 104, verse 29. What happens to a person when they actually die. Some say they go to limbo. Some say they go to purgatory. Some say they go to hell. Now, you know, this business about hell, as you're going there, I lived in Georgia, and I had a well which was about 80 feet deep, and I thought it was very, very deep. But then there was a house in front of me. Somebody bought the house, a retired man, from, it was a vet, and his well ran dry. So he decided to dig a deeper well, a 200-foot well. They brought the machines, and the machine was digging. Digging, digging. You know what? They never found hell, you know. They found rocks. They found mud. They found dirt. They found stones. But they never found hell. I say, wow. Maybe they're down there. Because how deep do you have to go to find hell? Very, very, very deep. No, not very, very deep. <laughs> it has to be very, very deep, but it's not down there. Do you know where hell is? Go to Revelation. Let me show you where hell is. Let me show you where hell is, hell is, hell is going to be. Go to Revelation. Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22. Actually, Revelation 21. Revelation 20, right? Revelation 20. 20. The Bible says this now. Let me, t let me show you where hell is. Right? The Bible says this. Revelation 20, 20, verse 8. This is where hell is. The Bible says now. Are we there? And shall go out to deceive the nation which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and who? Magog, to gather them to the battle. The number of whom is that the what? That's those people who died on the train. Look at this now. And he went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, of the beloved city, and what? Fire came what? Fire came? So where is hellfire? Where is hellfire right now? It's up. It's going to come down. It ain't down going up. Hellfire is reserved in the heavens, and God's going to rain hellfire down. Look at this thing now. So what happens when you die? The Bible says this now. Proverbs, Psalms 104, 29. Thou hidest thy face. They are troubled. Thou takest away their breath. They die, and they return to the what? But the Bible says when you die, you go to the what? It's a reversal. You jot down this text, Genesis 2, 7. God made Adam. The Bible says now, and the Lord God formed man out of the what? Yes. The dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostril the breath of what? Yes. And man became a what? A living soul. So turn the card over. God made man out of the dust. Right? When you die, where do you go back? To the dust. The spirit goes back to God out of the breath. And the body remains in the earth. Are you with me? Now look at this thing now, right? The dust. Job 27.3 says what Job says. 
All the while, my what? My breath is in me and the what? Spirit of God is where? Is in my nostrils. Are you with me? Right? So the Bible says now, it takes the body plus the to equal a living what? A living soul is a living, a living person. Right? Now, question now. When a man is put in the grave, can he return to his home? No. Let's go to Job. I like Job. Job chapter 7. Job chapter 7. As a matter of fact, while you're going there, I remember I was doing a campaign out in, uh, in California. A pretty big campaign. And we had an off night one Thursday night. And a lady was coming out, a Caucasian lady. She said, Evangelist, you call me Reverend Knox? Reverend Knox, um, would you come to my house for, for, for dinner? I said, sure. So we got the Bible worker and we... Nice house, we pulled up, double doors, beautiful home. Got in the home and we table was set and so forth. We told her that, you know, we're vegetarians, so she got these garden burgers and so forth. So the table was set and I sat.